afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Van Ostren, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, From Classroom to Corporate, Business and Management Resources to Help with the Transition, sponsored by SAGE and featuring Carrie Scandura, Ken Thompson, Paul Schwears, and Elizabeth Leonard. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you will also see a Q&A panel that you can use to submit questions or comments please feel free to submit these throughout the program. And finally, please note that today's program will be recorded, and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. And now I'd like to hand things over to Elizabeth. Thank you very much. It is my great pleasure to be part of this discussion, as I am a former business librarian and I have my MBA. And so it is exciting to be able to talk about business and management, as it is one of the fastest growing undergraduate majors today. And having a business background is becoming a prerequisite from jobs that have never required one before. Add to this that the world of business is also changing at lightning speed. So in the next hour, we're going to be exploring how business and management faculty can keep up with all of the latest trends, how they teach business and management students, what their expectations are for students conducting research, what recommendations they may have for librarians, and what their hot topics are in their specialties. So with that, let me introduce our speakers. Terry Scandura is a professor of management in the School of Business Administration at the University of Miami. From 2007 to 2012, she served as the Dean of the Graduate School of the University. Her fields of interest include leadership, mentorship, and applied research methods. She has been a visiting scholar in Japan, Australia, Hong Kong, China, and the United Arab Emirates. Dr. Skandura has authored or co-authored over 200 presentations, articles, and book chapters. She is a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, and the Southern Management Association. Her latest publication will be released later this year, a book titled Organizational Behavior and Evidence-Based Approach. Paul Michael Swears is a professor and chair of the Department of Management at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. He has published more than 35 refereed research articles and his case studies on Home Depot and Delta Airlines have appeared in six best-selling strategy textbooks. His case study, Food Lion versus the UFCW, Time for Change, was selected for the Best Case Award by the Academy of Management. He presently serves as an outside reviewer and writer for cases published by the Harvard Business School Press, and he is a member of the SAGE Business and Management Advisory Board. Last but not least, Ken Thompson is the professor and the former chair of management at DePaul University. He has co-authored four books, contributed to six others, and has been published in a number of journals, including the Academy of Management Executive, Organizational Dynamics, Journal of Social Psychology, Human Relations, and the Journal of Leadership and Organizational Studies, where he is the senior editor. Most of Dr. Thompson's academic and professional life has focused on improving organizational performance and building an engaged workforce. Dr. Thompson has a PhD from the University of Nebraska in organizational behavior and strategic management. So what we're going to do is go through a couple of major areas for discussion for about 40 minutes and then we'll leave the remainder of the time for Q&A. And as was mentioned before, please do go ahead and type in your questions as the speakers are discussing the topics. And if it's possible, I'll add in some of your questions as we go along. 
and then we'll leave the remainder for the formal Q&A session at the end. So let's start by talking about the, what happens in the classroom. So if I may, my first question for you three is, do you emphasize what's going to help the student get prepared for the corporate world, or are you talking mainly in your classroom about theoretical aspects of business? Uh, this is Ken Thompson. Um, I focus a lot on applications. I tell my students the first day I'm more of a mechanic. Uh, I still want to give them the code hooks of the theory, but it's how they learn to apply it to me that's essential to their development, both in uh, knowledge development and skill development. Yeah, I do the same thing. We have a large body of research on organizational behavior, industrial and organizational psychology, and so I really focus on applications of theory, uh, evidence-based uh, research, you know, to make them a better manager. If I can uh, add in, too, Terry, the evidence-based, I think, is so important because there's a lot of what I call armchair books out there that may lead people astray. Connecting the theory with empirical research and applying it is key uh, to the development of students. Uh, I'll agree with my colleagues, uh, and I, I also approach it from the perspective that it's my job to help these uh, MBA students, who, who are my primary audience, but also the undergraduates, uh, become better quality thinkers. So the mix of theory and uh, practical uh, management skills, I think, uh, uh, is, is an effort to combine those two together. Is there ever a time when all you're talking about is the theory? I don't like to put the theory front and center, but I like the theory to emerge out of the discussion. So uh, yes, theories are very important. I want to give them the vocabulary of management. So when they're talking to other people who also have advanced education in management, uh, they can use some common reference points uh, as they're talking across these various examples. Mm. I would concur um, almost 100%. Uh, are there times when I start with the theory? Maybe, but then roll it into applications. Um, will it evolve uh, ideal a mix of undergrads and grads and uh, with the application. And do you think that part of that's because business as, and management as a discipline is intended to prepare students for working in the real world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that business students today want skills that they can apply right away. Uh, they want, you know, they want something that's going to make them a better leader, a better manager. And so I think that that is um, our focus is preparing students for the corporate world or the organizational world. They may be working in hospitals, nonprofits, um, but we're definitely preparing them for the organizational world. I think, I think this is Paul Spears. I think business schools are in a unique for us to be sensitive to the fact that uh, we're uh, different than a trade school. And so uh, walking that society, you know, it's, it's, it, from my mind, it's like the, the old argument between a great book strip I like the idea of uh, rethinking, uh, uh, thinking of myself as someone who is engaged in, in, the, in just 
that uh, I actually but first a business school is a professional school so we're looking at developing skills and knowledge uh, focus on need and knowledge you want the students to get out of the program. Uh, they're they're uh, trying to strive for. I'd love to do a more specific approach, but I'm so lousy at it. Um, uh, but the, the goal is to get them to start thinking, particularly with undergrads. Grads, uh, I have a, it's a joy to deal with because they are thinking about things and doing these already in their work. One of the courses that I teach is a quality course uh, and using the Baldridge Criterion and uh, uh, Six Sigma. And uh, there, with undergrads, I really have to work hard to get them to realize the importance of these things. Now, that simply means the questions you ask, trying to pull it out, have them self-discovery that I think either Terry or Paul talked about earlier as a more problem And Terry, how about you? Um, I do. Sh I still do short lectures, but then I'll move on uh, to Harvard cases, uh, Northwestern negotiation exercises. In the case of the negotiation class, I also include self-assessments. For example, when I'm lecturing on personality, they actually take the Big Five personality assessment, so they're looking at their results while I talk about it. I think it makes it more relevant for them. I use videos, YouTube. TED Talks, and I also use team activities in all the courses that I teach. So you can see that it's a, it's a variety of different um, teaching methods, and I've found that that has evolved certainly over the last five years. Is that you know I just wouldn't do you know a class where I lecture from beginning to end ever again. Uh, you know students you know they really want to be engaged, they want to uh, learn different ways, and they they want to be involved in the discovery process. And Paul? Uh, like, like Terry, uh, although probably not as successfully, uh, I'm trying to build uh, more engagement uh, activities, uh, you know, kind of an action-based uh, learning uh, curriculum. Uh, I also uh, incorporate uh, cases. And uh, I've, uh, as Terry knows, I've developed a method to have the students write cases. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and uh, that has proved uh, uh, very helpful in helping students uh, kind of transition their mindset uh, into practical uh, organizational problem solving. And then, Paul, when you're thinking about all of the things that are happening in their you know, classroom, what's the, your expectation of the balance of responsibility between the professor and the student? I've been uh, more aggressive in recent uh, years in communicating uh, a more balanced uh, a set of responsibilities. Uh, the, the kind of passive character of education where the professor's up front and he or she is responsible for your learning outcomes, I think, is uh, uh, past its day. Uh, and uh, students are really being challenged to kind of step up. Uh, when, when Terry uh, uh, talks about, for example, working in those teams, uh, doing team uh, assessments and having students assess themselves is all part of that effort to uh, uh, at least uh, call their attention to the greater share of responsibility they have for their not only their own learning, but also for the learning of their classmates. Ken, is there anything you'd add to that? Is that your expectation as well? Yeah, well, uh, yeah and no. 
Um, uh, the yeah part is, yes, I want them to be more responsible for their education, but as we move into some of these more group things uh, or problem-based learning, um, the difficulty is I have to work harder. My responsibility to move that into not just what I call uh, easy talk sort of sessions where they're uh, really not getting deep enough in the case or deep enough in the resolution of the problem, I have to pull that out. So I have to be much more attuned. So I think my responsibility goes up in order to increase their responsibility, mm. if that makes any mm -hmm. sense. I think that, that I, you know, Ken's saying that they, they has to work harder. I mean, I think that with all these things going on in my classes, you know, this is controlled chaos. Okay, you know, and you have to, you know, you have to work harder after they do an activity to get them to sit down again, you know, settle down. They're very excited about it. And then you have to get them to process it so that you can extract the learning from it. Exactly. And I'd like just one more comment on that. You know, the, the folks at Harvard have shifted away from uh, case uh, learning to uh, participant-centered learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, part of signaling uh, that uh, rebalancing of responsibilities. And on the, on the workload question, I, I agree 100% on that. It, it certainly takes a lot more in a different kind of preparation. And this is particularly true as we're uh, uh, doing more work on distance ed. Uh, the amount of work and in, in the style of engagement that uh, uh, goes on in online courses uh, is, 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 is really challenging, especially as we're learning how to do it. Boy, you're absolutely right, Paul. I'm, uh, I teach one totally online course and then a blended course, and it's so hard. I feel so disconnected on the online courses. Uh, I try to, uh, when they have their team meetings, I try to uh, sit in on those by phone, but it's not the same. You aren't getting the feedback, but the responsibility for the learning certainly get, goes more and more on the student in those sorts of environments. That's sort of true with blended as well. So it, it increases to me the responsibility of the instructor to make sure it's a good learning environment, but also on the responsibility of the student uh, to work uh, much harder, uh, be much more uh, thoughtful in their activities. So I think Terry might be the only one of you who is teaching solely in a face-to-face -face classroom. So. What might be interesting then to talk about is, is there a difference between the teaching methods that you can use face-to-face -face and the teaching methods that you can use in uh, either a blended classroom or an all-online classroom? Do you want to start on that one, Paul? Uh, yeah, I've been teaching online now for about uh, four years, and I... I, I still feel like a freshman. Um, the, uh, the challenges are, uh, are, are really quite uh, uh, high, I, I think, uh, particularly around the question of engaging the students and, and developing a, a, the capacity to dialogue with them. Uh, the software that we're using today, I think, uh, represents a rather significant advance. And as that software begins to uh, mature, I'm, I, I'm quite optimistic about what we're going to be able to do online. But I don't think it's just me. I just went through a workshop with the folks at Harvard, and uh, they're, they're struggling with the same uh, issues as all of us are. I would concur. Uh, for the online course, I feel less of a freshman more as a failure um, because I don't feel connected that much with the students, though I try. Uh, I have to basically do a video um, lecture, audio, visual lecture, PowerPoint with voice overloads, but use the Karen um, so I can do a few more writing on the slides and it, it processes a little easier. But I never get the feedback uh, adequately th that I have a good understanding if they understand. Because even if you give them assignments, uh, uh, unless you require them to come in uh, to campus, which we don't, because we have people spread all over, uh, it, it really makes it hard to determine how, how well they're understanding activities. And are you giving them the same assignments, Ken, that you give your face-to-face -face students? 
Uh, yes, except they're more because uh, I feel for the student that may feel totally alone out there. So it's much more group assignments. So there's no individual uh, uh, measure of how well they're doing. I can assess how well the group is doing, but not so much the individual. So I'm afraid I may be losing some deliberately, those who want to be social loafers, and others that are just get confused and then just go along with the group. So that troubles me a lot. That keeps me up at night sometimes. Mm. And Terry, is there anything around the face-to-face -face experience that you worry that you might not be able to replicate online? Or conversely, is there something about teaching online that you think you could pull into a face-to-face -face classroom? Yeah, this is something that, you know, University of Miami is a private school and we're moving into hybrid programs. I'm participating in one, you know, in a face-to-face -face component where they, they come to campus and I, I teach one module in the afternoon. Um, so we're definitely moving in this direction and so I'm really, you know, it's very interesting to, for my, to hear my colleagues and valuable for me to hear my colleagues speak about the online learning environment. I think you can tell from the types of things that I do, you know, with uh, case study discussions uh, and team activities. But I think that uh, the self-assessments and I think that the videos will work very well, actually, in an online environment. Uh, I think that, you know, we'll have to adapt, you know, team activities uh, and case study discussions going down the road. Yeah, I would agree. Even your use of uh, TED and some of the short uh, online uh, um, um, sessions are kind of neat. Yeah. And Paul, one last question before we move off of this topic. Did I hear you properly saying that one of the things that you're working on now is participant learning? Uh, uh, Participant-centered learning. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the new uh, descriptor of uh, uh, case study-led uh, uh, research. Uh, I'm trying to just use it as a, a rhetorical uh, north, uh, northern star uh, for uh, making that shift uh, and balancing these responsibilities uh, between the faculty member and the students. Uh, because this question of engagement is uh, more, more important now than ever. Uh, both in, uh, in campus, on campus, and online, students really do want to be involved in the process. And uh, the, I, the, the, the former model of just being the director and calling on the students uh, isn't, uh, isn't sufficient anymore. So uh, we have to figure out a new way to think about that. Mm. OK, let me move us to our next topic which is about research. So we've spoken about what you're doing in the classroom. Can you talk about what your expectations are from the kinds of research that your students will do? And let me maybe make it slightly more specific. Are there ever times when you direct your students to go searching for any particular types of information in any particular types of places? Or are you expecting when they're conducting an assignment that they know how to do their research? And Terry, do you mind if I start with you for this one? No, that's fine. Um, our university librarian, our business librarian, uh, does a complete presentation during their orientation about what resources the library has and how to access them. So I assume that they know that. So you know, when I give an assignment, I think you know, we kind of expect that they know how to do that. That's my expectation. I think what they are doing, um, in fact, is more likely to be Google, Google searches, Google Scholar searches, or Bing searches. So I think they're using the search engines uh, more than we probably think they are. Mm. Ken, what's uh, true for you? Uh, yeah, I think they're using more of the uh, uh, 
search engines, Google Scholar and stuff like that. However, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, in, in my strategy course, I actually have a librarian come in and talk about uh, we're very blessed at DePaul with a number of uh, particularly business uh, databases that we have, and that person can go through them. I also give a list of what's out there primarily to the library and the databases to help them do an industry analysis and find data on customer segmentation, psychographics, and uh, uh, just general economic forecasting. Uh, for the org behavior course, a little lighter there, but I do um, uh, mix the text I use uh, along with a lot of uh, um, locations of articles that they should, uh, uh, that they're required to read for the course as, as background material and discussion material. Uh, this is Paul. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll add. I'll agree with all of that uh, and just give a couple of, of uh, examples. One of the things that I found myself doing in recent years is, is very much moving away from the old kind of term paper uh, type model. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I invented the uh, SWIFT learning method uh, to have the students actually write cases uh, because that engaged them create, create, uh, creatively and also uh, reduced opportunities for plagiarism and you know all the all the problems that uh, uh, come about when you have that old model where they can go out and buy a term paper from some uh, provider and things like that. Uh, and I also do other assignments that you know I have them do a job crafting exercise where they have to write their own uh, their their future job description. Uh, it personalizes it, but it also allows me to require certain technical. Uh, uh, place technical expectations on them. Uh, and, and lastly, this morning uh, I had a meeting with uh, some of our uh, folks here at George Washington with a representative to Sa uh, from SAGE uh, who is putting together databases for librarians to help with students. But the topic of today's meeting was preparing uh, uh, case uh, uh, business plans for business plan competitions. Uh, and having uh, the students have to uh, go out and search for uh, resources in order to make a persuasive case regarding their entrepreneurial aspirations. So I, I think the, the way we're engaging students with the library uh, is changing, and I think our librarians have the resources. Uh, what we need uh, is a better process. Yeah, it is so much uh, easier with uh, the Internet and uh, uh, students being able to do research, pull out some of the sources in the library at home. It's just amazing. And even uh, what I consider uh, more just um, uh, internet sources. For example, I'm a Baldridge uh, National uh, uh, Examiner, and I have the students uh, download some of the uh, uh, recipients' uh, applications, and then we talk about, for example, tonight in an OB, uh, MBA course, we'll be talking about how OB fits in with organizational uh, requirements, uh, looking at some of the Baldridge winners uh, and, and what they have done as an organization. So it really opens up, uh, again, going back to what Terry's one book on evidence-based, we can look at here's what different companies do, and we can add the component, here's why they do them. And that takes a, a much stronger partnership uh, uh, with libraries and the databases and their help to help us. Where do you all personally search for information? Uh, this again, I'll go to the library databases first, and then if not, we have terrific. Uh, we have a, a corner uh, on the library web page that says "Ask a Librarian." So if I get stuck, I'll ask some of them. They're very knowledgeable and can help uh, uh, help find resources for me. And do you have your like? set of databases? Well, for me, that would uh, depend on um, if uh, what's the topic of the research I may be doing or the material I'm looking for. So sometimes mm -hmm. I'll go back to uh, find, maybe use a Google Scholar, find a particular article, then look at the reference section, who's known in the field, and then maybe start doing a searching for that person using the library database. Okay, and Terry, how about you? 
Mar Library is terrific. It has EBSCOhost. It has ABIM forms. It has everything. Um, we can send a student or a research assistant to the library to do a search. That's pretty traditional. But also, um, Google Scholar, if you search something, there's a link underneath that says Find It at UM. And I can click on that link, and it'll take me into our library's portal, and I can find the article there. So um, the search engines are becoming you know, a really efficient way to search uh, you know, for literature reviews. Well, I like that connection right back to the university. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. I, uh, Paul, I have to anything to add? To, well, I just have to confess to over-reliance on my research assistants. Uh, so most of the searching that I do is usually in the brainstorming process uh, when I'm trying to uh, put together a new idea and uh, draw my mind map of how I want to uh, approach a particular topic. Uh, I will uh, use whatever resources uh, I can kind of come to mind uh, when I'm uh, when I'm in that phase. But most of the uh, the, the serious kind of get me this, get me that, uh, uh, I turn over to the uh, research assistants. Okay, one last question for you all on this particular topic before I move directly into a question about libraries, which is. How much does currency matter when you're thinking about the research that you do or the research that your students do? And I don't mean money. I mean uh, the recency of the material that you're reading. Uh, this is Ken. It's absolute. Uh, the students get engaged if they see the currency of what we're covering. So to me, that's helpful now to go back and get then here's to explain how the research fits in, then going back a little further. But currency is uh, important to know where that field's going. Yeah, I agree. Students are very aware uh, that important change are happening. Changes are happening, uh, such as you know, impact of diversity, impact of immigration, economic changes, technology. They're interested in the impact of social media, uh, globalization, competition. Now, all these things are impacting uh, the organizational world, and so I think being current is is critical. I, I agree that currency is very important. However, I, I, I do work very hard uh, to try to get students to uh, learn how to place things in historical context. Uh, this is particularly true when I'm crafting uh, assignments or when I'm directing them about how to approach an assignment. Uh, I will, uh, like Terry mentioned, uh, you know, civil rights and, and diversity type issues. I don't really want them to think diversity has uh, just appeared uh, overnight. Uh, I really want to ground them in the uh, long-term social struggle uh, to deal with diversity. Now, using that topic as an example, I, I will have students uh, uh, do a project where they have to go and discover diversity challenges outside of the United States so that they can see that uh, diversity issues are a, are a global issue and then anchor it in contemporary, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether it's gay discrimination in Russia or uh, sectarian violence in the Middle East, they're able to then see how these, are in, how these relate uh, to the topic we're discussing in class. Thank you. So you've all spoken a fair amount about libraries. If you could wave your magic wand and make the world the perfect place, what is it that you would change about libraries? That's a toughie. I certainly want to make sure they keep getting the, uh, enough resources so they can be current on uh, uh, having online resources. I think the age of having the books may be gone, uh, well, at least maybe journals, because they can get them online. Uh, and then uh, having the resources to better prepare libraries to handle some of the more complex uh, where is this sorts of questions and what are different avenues, maybe not just journals, but what's out there on the Internet 
that also can be a source. Terry or Paul, are there things that you think that libraries can do that would add more value? I think our library is doing a, a terrific job. The, the thing that I really think that they can do is do more outreach by coming to students, coming to the classroom, um, presenting topics um, on how to search uh, for specific course projects. I mean, I'm make, making notes. I mean, I have a project that I do for a Leading Across Cultures class where uh, we do, um, I have the students do a culture analysis, you know, where they go in depth, you know, on, on Sub-Saharan Africa as an example. And then each different team takes a different region of the world and they do a presentation. So we all learn, you know, about five or six different cultures from this project. So I think it, it would be helpful if the librarians could, or a librarian could come to the classroom and then talk to the students about how to find information on that specific topic. That's an example I can think of, is, is coming to the classroom more often. And I know everybody's busy, but I think that would be time. terrific. <laughs> and you'd give um, up your class time for it? I sure would give up class time and do. Yeah, I would do that. Uh, to, to the conversation, I would add, uh, I, I don't think I'm loath to give advice uh, to uh, librarians because I think libraries are, are, do such a great job. Uh, but what I would uh, give advice to is, is the faculty at business schools and librarians collectively to uh, practice a little bit uh, higher level of collaboration. I think we're both uh, uh, caught up in, in the rapid change that's occurring. And uh, in particular, I think business school faculty uh, really don't understand uh, how librarians are, are imagining the future and how they see their role uh, as evolving. Uh, and I mm -hmm. think if uh, the business school faculty had uh, some greater awareness of that, there would actually be a more productive dialogue possible uh, between uh, between the two. I mean, librarians have always uh, had uh, enjoyed academic status at the best uh, universities. And uh, I think what's happened uh, is that there's more of a, of a perception of the library as a service uh, rather than as a collegial activity. And I would like uh, both partners to this process to uh, uh, reactivate uh, the, the collegial aspects of, of uh, of the library as part of the university life. And that to me is so important because right now I think libraries in universities are facing so many challenges. It's so easy for administration to cut uh, 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 those quote services, but the long-term effect of what it does to faculty in terms of their research uh, can be devastating. So we need to develop mm -hmm. that partnership and find out what are the needs of the library so we can help support them when they when these have some of these crises. Okay, so we're going to move on to our last topic, which is hot topics. What is it, when you think about the things that you yourself are studying, what are the hot topics in your areas? Um, I'm currently studying immigration. I'm studying, you know, uh, how immigrants assimilate into the workforce through the relationship they have with their direct boss. I think that's uh, a hot topic right now in organizational behavior, industrial psychology as well. Uh, so globalization, um, vir the virtual workforce, I think, is a hot topic. You know, people working remotely, we, we need a lot more research on that. Um, Anything, the internet and social media, um, I think that's going to be a really big topic, how personal information uh, should or shouldn't be protected, um, you know, that's used in social media. So I think those are some of the, what I think are hot topics right now in, uh, in organizational behavior. I would add to it, uh, right now I'm looking at uh, particularly the use of open book management and uh, how it enhances engagement, uh, employee engagement particularly, and how employee engagement relates to productivity and uh, customer engagement. 
Uh, other research I'm doing is problem-based learning and uh, kind of out there and trying to improve the productivity of universities. What is the linkage between uh, students getting careers? And this is really based on University of Wisconsin Stout, which was one of the first Baldridge winners, and what they looked at and how they linked where their students were going and the skills and knowledge they needed, driving that back into program improvement. And we're trying to track uh, four different universities and see what information do they gather, uh, and then how do they uh, use it, if they use it, to improve programs, efficiency and effectiveness. Then the last thing we're working is on a uh, um, psych psychological capital and positive board behavior in organizations. I think and we'll Ken, I'm afraid you were fading off for some some people there, and I'm afraid that they might have missed the last bit that you were talking about. Oh, okay. So if uh, you don't uh, mind, just yeah. Sure, it's a uh, positive org organizational behaviors and positive uh, be, uh, approaches to behaviors in organizations. Some of the stuff Martin Seligman and Fred Luthan have developed re recently. Thank you. And from my side, it's uh, I'm very interested in the uh, what I call the changing uh, employment relationship, trying to figure out uh, how we tell bosses from employees, or more specifically, how do we know when we even have an employee? Uh, so that's that's very important to me. It's part of the of the broader employment law and ethics uh, uh, subject matter that I, uh, that I also teach. And then uh, lastly, I got a new graduate course in uh, executive thinking skills. Uh, and so I, I, I take that as a, a leadership perspective and try to, to bring in some of the new uh, neuroscience-related uh, uh, research uh, and bring it into uh, the classroom, turn it into specific skills that students might use uh, in their role as leaders. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over to the audience. We've got some questions that have already come in. And Paul, I'm afraid I might have gotten to this one a little late, and we'll see if we can remember what it was that you said. The question is, what did you mean about improving the research process? Well, I, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure if I'll have this right. But uh, I, as I recall, I'm, I'm interested in improving uh, the research process that students use to present original to present and support uh, uh, the original ideas that I'm trying to uh, uh, extract from them. I'm, when, when I'm giving those assignments, I, I'll go back to that plagiarism thing. I'm looking for something where I can uncover uh, their original uh, contributions. And I, don't, I want them to be able to access research in such a way where they're forced or invited to uh, scour uh, different sources uh, uh, generate uh, ideas and then be able to uh, communicate those ideas as a coherent uh, whole as part of their project. Mm -hmm. And one of the librarians was saying how nice it is to hear you all voice the value of the librarian visit and commented that there are other ways that they use to help students that don't take your class time, such as online help or office hours. So are, how much do you point students to using the library in alternative ways? And that could include things like pointing them to any video tutorials that they might have. I think it was Ken who mentioned reaching out um, for virtual help using the Ask a Librarian. Right, I encourage them to use that, encourage to go down. Our librarians are uh, at least very on our main campus in the loop, very well versed in a business, uh, less so in the uh, uh, some of the satellite campuses. So I do encourage them uh, to look to the resources and get help from um, uh, the librarians. And uh, as I said, uh, we we'll, we'll bring them in the classroom to talk about the resources out there. So the student now has a face to link with mm -hmm. and to look for when they go uh, to the library. Uh, I, I, I think there's a wonderful opportunity for librarians to develop some uh, web-based instruction uh, for how to use uh, library resources. 
Uh, and I, I would very much like to see uh, some of uh, creative uh, uses of the newer technology uh, to help students use a library. I've become a fan in recent months of lynda.com and their uh, style of uh, using screencast and, and in, per, in video lectures and really uh, well-grounded, this is how you do it type of instruction that I think uh, offers some uh, modeling, available, uh, modeling for librarians. I did a survey with uh, students a few months ago, and one of the things that students were saying is how important it is for their faculty to endorse the resources that they use, and that included the library. And so I will just encourage on behalf of the librarians out there for business faculty to not just hope that uh, their students are going to get that message but that you all continue to do what you've said you're doing, which is to promote the use of the library with your, with your students, because it really does make a huge difference. There's a question, though, from one of the librarians, which is, what's the best way to promote you, the business faculty? And the person goes on to say, I would love to do outreach in their classrooms and have offered to do so via email and other campus communication channels, but have yet to receive a response, positive or negative. Yeah, I, I saw that question. I, you know, I think that um, what would be a really easy thing to do is collect course syllabi, and you know, and then you can have a, you know a work study do it, or you can do it. But then look at the kinds of projects that faculty are assigning, and I think that if I received an email from a librarian that specifically referenced a specific a, a specific project that I was assigning, I think I would res I would respond to that rather than just some generic email blast that everybody gets. You know, we all get so much email that, you know, I think a lot of times the emails get lost when you do outreach. Any other tips from either you of you on how someone could get your attention if for some reason you hadn't been a library user? Well, I, I, I think, think one of the one of the things librarians uh, might do to help get our attention is to uh, help uh, faculty communicate to students the meaning of uh, uh, credible uh, and reliable information. Uh, I think our students, uh, given the way the web works, uh, you know, in a, in, in, a, in a kind of Fox News culture, where the the idea of the sensational uh, displaces the, the credible, uh, and that librarians are actually uh, a, a new kind of gatekeeper in the sense of uh, uh, being the, the, uh, a truth teller to say this is the nature of that resource and this is how much confidence you can uh, place in that resource as you're uh, drawing conclusions and making recommendations, et cetera, and that is making business decisions. Mm -hmm. I would agree, and to me, I want to create a lifelong learner in that student. That's what I really like to develop, you know, have the uh, librarian come into the classroom because now there's a face-to-face. -face. Too often we do things totally non-face-to-face, -face, but I want that person to know there's a real mm -hmm. individual there in the library that you now know that can help you out. I think that's critical. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. They need to know that there's a person that they can go to. Students often aren't as proactive as we'd like them to be in seeking out these resources. There is something about the human touch, isn't there? It's as if the more virtual the world gets, the more the human touch matters. Uh, on that topic. Jenny, the last thing I'll say about the, the course syllabus is one of the ways you can get them is from the students themselves. So if you can't get your faculty to respond to your emails and give you the syllabus for you to examine to see how you can help, ask the students. They've got them. Oh, so yes, bring they have them. them. With them with their assignments. So just get the copies of them from the students and then contact the faculty and see if that helps any. 
Yeah, the other thing is, I, I saw Jenny's question, is that our undergraduate office and our MBA office has them. We have to submit them for accreditation purposes, so they have them. In some programs, they're even posted online, because students more and more before they take a course, at least at Miami, again, we're a smaller private school, they want to actually see the syllabus before they take a course. And I've actually seen certain programs post them online. But I, I understand that may vary by uh, university. Yeah, I think it's almost yeah. even more important to look at the assignments because yes. many times the syllabuses are too global and it doesn't get into here's how I focus this particular topic. That's a great point. Yeah, it's true too. And there's a question for, is there a link to the course on executive thinking skills? Uh, uh, only if you're registered at George Washington University. But uh, <laughs> if, if someone wanted to uh, contact me directly, I'd be happy to share uh, my syllabus uh, with them. And then, Terry, there's a question for you about – I'm sorry, did I cut you off, Paul? Uh, no, I was, I, I was just going to ask if, if our emails will be given out or, or if I should maybe just say it. <laughs> If you don't mind saying it, I think that would be great. Okay. Uh, excuse the hubris, but it's prof1, prof, P-R-O-F, numerical one, at gwu.edu. Thank you. Okay, Terry, this one's for you. You mentioned that you'd value more classroom instruction from librarians. Who do you prefer to initiate the request for that instruction? Would you email the librarian, or would you prefer that a librarian reach out to you with a general offer of instruction? Uh, I think it'd be great if they'd reach out to me. I think, you know, I, I have reached out in the past um, from time to time, depending on, you know, what course I'm teaching in the assignment. But I think it'd be really, I think it'd be really great if librarians would reach out to me, either with a general offer or, a, again, you know, a specific offer um, of instruction. And do any of you have a link? Well, I should ask this maybe slightly differently. First, do all of you use course management systems, something like Blackboard? We use Blackboard. We use D2L, which is a variant of Blackboard. Uh, we use Blackboard, but you, you, I can't uh, express uh, my fan. I, I'm not a fan. Okay, uh, it's, I, I, I find it to be very still very DOS based. Uh, and so I only use it when, when I have to. Okay. So I'm assuming then, Paul, for you, you're not really putting up your resources into Blackboard. Is that right? When I teach a course online, of course, I build it all into Blackboard because that is our, our platform. However, when I'm not teaching the course online, I will use a variety of tools, one of which uh, uh, is uh, Dropbox for sharing things like syllabi and un unencumbered uh, resources that you know, don't have copyright problems. Uh, if I do have uh, uh, copyright issues, um, uh, mostly that involves readings in my graduate courses. And I tend to go to Harvard because it's just simply, I can go to Harvard, put all the cases, and, and find the resources I need, and then they will buy a package from Harvard. Uh, and so mm. it's, it's a hybrid system that I use. And do you, at that point, link as well to the librarian or to the library itself, or you're relying on the course pack solely? Uh, in that situation, the library is out of the loop because uh, the library is uh, more closely linked to Blackboard. And so it's, uh, it, it tends to take them out of the loop, actually. Okay. And Terry, what about you? When you're using Blackboard, are you linking in any way to the library or the library's resources? The uh, university automatically puts a link to the library resources on, on the Blackboard site. It's a, one of the buttons that's over to the left. Okay. And Ken, I'm not sure if people could hear you. I believe you said that you were using Desire to Learn. And are you using any links out to the library? Uh, yes, he is Desire to Learn. And then uh, I do on uh, all the other articles that I have them read, I give them basically here's where to find it in the library sort, uh, sources because as a journal editor, I know the importance of downloads 
uh, within the process. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question if anyone wants to quickly type one in. And while I'm waiting to see if anyone has it, there's an interesting comment that in Canada, course outlines are not public documents. And so the person had to obtain research ethics approval for a study and needed faculty consent to obtain the course outlines. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, it's going to be hard to get them other than contacting specific faculty and asking for them. Okay, so here's your last question, and it's, do you ever require that students use library resources? Uh, this is Ken. Uh, uh, sure, almost. Probably I have one or two articles a week that I want them to read that's beyond the text material, and that would be something that uh, would be linked uh, to the library uh, database. I only do it by inference. That is, if I give them an assignment, uh, I would anticipate that they would use the library, but I seldom say specifically, you must use the library for this particular uh, assignment. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I assume they're using the library, but more and more, I suspect that they're using search engines, as I mentioned earlier. Well, let me ask a variant of that, which is, do you require that they are reading peer-reviewed material? I would have a, a mix of everything. Remember our original, it seems a long time ago, uh, when we started, uh, we talked about the importance of relating the theory to practice. So I may use a good org dynamics article that translates research into practice or some HBR articles. Yeah, I agree. Harvard Business Review articles, uh, organizational dynamics, the academy management executives would be the typical sources for MBAs. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I refer to those as pracademic type articles, yeah. uh, 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 resources. Uh, the the journals have, be got, have become, for the most part, so technical uh, that most students find them inaccessible. Mm -hmm. Any last words from any of you, either for each other or for any of the audience about how teaching has changed or how research in business and management is making you excited? Well, I've been at it for 27 years or something at DePaul and probably 40 years overall. God, am I that old? Uh, it always is a wonderment how this field is changing and the new research that has developed. It's an exciting uh, t time and place to be to make uh, teaching much more relevant for students and help them on their journey of learning and careers. Yeah, well, I agree. Me, I think it's. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, to me, it feels like a, like an adventure uh, sport. You know, a little bit like I took up uh, snowboarding, and uh, it's really thrilling. But uh, when you fall, it hurts a lot. Uh, the, uh, I think it's a wonderful time for uh, uh, libraries to be part of a new uh, learning environment. And um, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity today to connect with the wider community of uh, librarians. I notice our, our top guy uh, is uh, uh, it's Shamul Bengad is on the list, so hello, uh, a shout out to him and a thank you to all of you who are, are working so hard to help this learning experience uh, both be both fun and, uh, and, and a true learning experience. Here, here. Yeah, I agree. I mean, with, with globalization, you know, virtual workforce, all these trends, social media, you know, I think it's a really exciting time to be teaching um, business. Thank you so much. I'll let you have the last word, Terry. Jen, anything that you'd like to add? Hi. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say um, thank you for joining us today. And I wanted to give all our presenters a virtual round of applause for spending some time with us and sharing this great information. Um, and as a reminder to our audience, we have recorded today's program. So please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from us that will include instructions on how to access the archive. And thanks again to all our participants for joining us.